Good evening. Uh, many thanks for staying with us. Uh, my name is Edmund Birch, and uh, I'm delighted to host this Q&A um, with our guests. And let me begin by saying congratulations on this film. I teach French literature in Cambridge University, and I think that um, anyone who loves Alexandre Dumas is going to love watching this film. Um, it's, such, thank you. it's such a joy. Um, so thank you so much for being with us. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions myself, I'm afraid, uh, the privilege of being the, the chairing this. But then we're going to open it up, and if you've got questions, we want to hear them. Um, uh, we're going to be, I'm going to be, I've been instructed to speak in English, but of course, there's going to be the langue as we go through. Um, so I'm going to begin by saying that this is for, you know, this is an enormous novel, as you obviously know, hundreds and hundreds of pages. Um, can you tell us a bit about what it was like adapting this? And I'm really interested in whether there were things in the novel that you felt were confusing, strange, shocking, needed to be um, less prominent, whether there were the features of the novel that you wanted to promote and prioritize. Tell us a bit about this process of adapting an enormous work of fiction um, for, into a three-hour film. Bonsoir. <laughs> <laughs> um, quand on s'attaque à, quand on a commencé le travail avec Mathieu sur sur Monte Cristo, on sortait de de ce très long travail sur les trois mousquetaires. Et, et en fait, on s'était fait une philosophie euh, qui, est, qui, est, qui est la nôtre, qui est d'essayer de euh, de travailler à rendre compte euh, de la sensation de lecture. C'est-à-dire que quand on s'attaque à une telle masse, à une telle à une telle folie. On est obligé de faire des choix qui sont des choix qui, sont, qui ont une certaine radicalité. Et, mais ce qui était très important pour nous, c'était justement de retrouver le sentiment. Il y a dans, dans Monte Cristo euh, une chose qui est très particulière, c'est un voyage dans les genres littéraires. Et c'est ce qui fait vraiment une particularité dans le, dans le roman. Euh, on passe du thriller à la romance, à la tragédie, à la comédie humaine. Et on voulait écrire un film. On savait qu'on avait, face à, à l'énorme masse du roman de Dumas, on avait 140 pages et 3 heures de film devant nous. Et on voulait essayer, par contre, de retranscrire avec les moyens du cinéma dans le, le, dans, de, de, de traverser un certain nombre de genres et on a pris une décision qui était une décision fondamentale avec Mathieu c'est de, de travailler en écrivant du point de vue de Dantès et d'essayer de, de, en fait, de regarder l'œuvre du point de vue du personnage ce qui n'est pas ce que fait Dumas qui dans toute la deuxième partie du, du roman éclate les, les points de vue donc on a pris un certain nombre de principes on a essayé de s'y tenir When Mathieu and I started working on The Count of Monte Cristo, we'd just come out of writing The Three Musketeers. And a philosophy that we reached through Three Musketeers was we want to recreate the feeling that you have when you read the novel. When you're dealing with such a huge text, such an enormous mass, of course, you're going to have to make cuts and selections. We're dealing with 140 minutes, three hours. That's very different. But we wanted to recreate that feeling. And there was another principle we had which was um, in The Count of Monte Cristo, you go through a lot of different literary genres. There's uh, elements of a thriller, of romance, of human comedy, of tragedy, and we really wanted to recreate all of that. And finally, another element is we chose to center the narrative on Dantes's point of view. The original novel goes into the perspectives of many other characters, and we made that choice to really stick with Dantes. Um. Mathieu, did you want to come in? Je trouve que c'est beaucoup mieux que ce qu'il a dit. Hein? <laughs> I agree. I will just add uh, one thing, which there was a guiding principle. That it was only going to be one movie. Right. So, uh, and that was a big decision because um, it, it could seem counterintuitive considering that we had made two movies from The Musketeers and The Musketeers is roughly half mm. of Monte Cristo mm. page-wise. Uh, but they, from the get-go, decided that you could not spend an entire movie uh, just building up something uh, and not seeing it come to fruition. Uh, it would be too frustrating. Uh, so that was also a very, 
encapsulating device because you, I mean it's a long movie but mm -hmm. tough choices needed to be made and it also resulted in a lot of the adjustments that they made which is in order to make something believable within the time frame of three hours some of the adjustments were also in because Dumas cheats a lot but uh, part of it is because he knows you're going to have more or less forgotten uh, what he wrote a thousand pages before. Uh, and and they had to reverse engineer some of it. So some of the decisions, notably uh, Mercedes, uh, Fernand Morsef, their social extraction uh, needed to be believable for that to you know, make sense over the course of just the one picture. Uh, so th that was a very big decision. And uh, it was actually... It was an element of risk, even from a financial standpoint, that was quite considerable, but it was a, a, an absolute. Uh, it had to be just the one movie. It's really interesting to hear you talk about that, Dimitri, because I was thinking about, about that. You know, what would it be if, in the course of the film, Edmond Dantes didn't really get his revenge? That might be incredibly disappointing in some respects. And I was thinking about revenge as a theme because it's such an important theme in, in the novel and in the way that you've made this wonderful film. And I was thinking about how to build a film around revenge, because revenge can be very cyclical. It can be very... Um, it can be quite confusing, you know, the two characters, the person who's the Avenger, the person that they're attacking, they can, they can blur and, and mirror one another a little bit. The Avenger takes on the person they're attacking who takes on them back and back and back, and it goes on and on and on. So I wanted to hear a bit about that, how you, how you, how you were working on, how you organized this film around this theme of revenge and, and what you think is important about this theme and, and in, in, in your filmmaking. La question de, de la vengeance, en fait, elle n'est pas que celle de Dantes dans le film, puisqu'il y a plusieurs personnages qui incarnent la vengeance. Et en fait, avec Alexandre, on a construit le film sur plusieurs vengeances. Il y a la vengeance d'Edmond Dantes, qui est évidemment celle qui structure tout le, le, le livre et le film. Mais il y a aussi la vengeance d'André, le personnage d'André qui cherche à venger ce qui lui est arrivé. Il y a le personnage d'Angèle ce que son frère a trahi qui cherche à venger. Il y a le personnage d'Anna Maria joué par Aïdé, Aïdé, je veux dire, joué par Anna Maria, qui cherche à venger son père. Donc en fait, il y a quatre trajectoires de vengeance. Nous, on s'est concentré sur la première, mais il y a les trois autres viennent comme expliquer, souligner ou surligner la principale. Et en fait, on voit sur ces quatre parcours de vengeance qu'au fond, il y a plusieurs choix de vengeance. Soit on choisit l'œil pour œil, dent pour dent, tu m'as tué, je te tue, ce qui est le cas de Andrea. Soit il y a le pardon ou l'abandon de la vengeance qui est le cas de Haïdé à la fin puisqu'elle choisit l'amour plutôt que la vengeance. Et au fond, le personnage de Monantès, il est dans un intermédiaire. C'est-à-dire qu'il renonce à se venger, mais il ne pardonne pas. C'est une troisième voie entre le, le pardon et la vengeance. Et on, ce qu'on trouvait intéressant avec Alexandre, c'est que... Et, et, nous, on a voulu faire de Edmond Dantès et de Monte Cristo un grand personnage romantique parce que c'est un personnage, la création de, de, de Monte Cristo, c'est un personnage qui a totalement, par exemple, influencé Batman, qui est un vengeur masqué, sans pouvoir, mais avec le pouvoir de l'argent. Mais la différence de Batman, c'est que c'est un héros romantique. Au fond, la personne à qui il en veut le plus, c'est Mercedes. Et au fond, ce qu'il recherche, c'est l'amour. Et quand il comprend qu'il est rattrapé par l'amour de Mercedes, il abandonne à la fois sa vengeance et son amour. What's interesting about this story is that it's got multiple revenges. Of course, there's Edmond Dantes' revenge, which is central and organizes the story. But we also have the revenge plots of other characters, such as uh, Angèle, Aide, André. And these other revenge stories serve to underline, punctuate, highlight Dantes' revenge story in different ways. But what it also does is it gives you different paths. So André chooses eye for an eye. He goes down the revenge route. He kills as revenge for his father wanting to kill him. We then have Aide who chooses to give up on revenge and forgive. And with Dantes, we came up with a third way, which is to give up on the act of revenge, but to not forgive. 
And another dimension that was very important to us was to highlight how Dantes really is a romantic character. Dantes is the forerunner of figures um, such as Batman, but he's not just this avenger with mysterious powers. He's a man in love. If you dig deep, the person he's most angry at is Mercedes, and what he most wants is love. And in the moment that Mercedes equals his love, that is when he can give up on love and give up on his revenge. Again, it's way better. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm really struck by the, obviously I'm really struck by the Batman comparison that you've drawn. And, 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 and it's right because, of course, Batman is an astonishingly wealthy individual who puts his vast resources um, to the work of um, bettering society and doing, doing things. And there's that interesting question about a hero who, as a consequence of his wealth, is somehow separated out or separated off from society. And, and that's quite an important theme here, I suppose. And it leads into a question that I, ha I was really struck by when I was watching this film, um, which is, what do you think is the vision of French society that your film and that the novel gives us. Because if we think about it from the perspective of Edmond Dantes, and um, Alexander, you were talking about this perspective guiding your approach to the film. From Dantes's perspective, French society seems corrupt, self-serving, petty, is that fair? Is this a criticism of society? What idea of France does the film give us, do you think? For no, for... Pardon? La, la France d'aujourd'hui ou de l'époque? Well, uh, there could be both, because of course it is a historical film, and film is, as we know, set in the early part of the 19th century, um, but um, it has resonances with now, and that might have been on your mind as well, I'm sure, when you were thinking about this. J'ai justement, le, le, non pas que la France ne puisse pas être écorchée et jugée, mais j'ai l'impression que la force de Monte Cristo, et je pense que ce qui fait Monte Cristo, c'est un personnage qui est vraiment mythique, qui est sorti de l'œuvre dont il est issu. Et je crois qu'il y a une très grande force et une très grande résonance aujourd'hui avec Monte Cristo, euh, justement parce que la force de ce mythe, c'est que l'histoire n'a pas d'époque, n'a pas de nation. Euh, et c'est vrai que ce que ça incarne et la possibilité pour, je pense, les spectateurs et nous les premiers avec Mathieu, de la, de la capacité à, à faire corps avec Dantes et à, à, à s'identifier à ce personnage, c'est que c'est un destin euh, euh, de tout temps. Euh, maintenant, à l'intérieur de ça, on a trouvé très intéressant avec Mathieu, après avoir travaillé sur Les Mousquetaires, qui est un peu le récit de la fin d'une époque, qui est celui de la fin de la chevalerie et donc euh, la, 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 la mort d'une époque. Monte Cristo, qui est écrit quasiment à la même période, c'est le début de l'ère industrielle et c'est le, 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 le premier vrai héros individualiste. Et s'il euh, ressemble un peu à Batman, ou s'il en est en tout cas un, euh, il en est un peu à l'origine, c'est un peu un anti-Robin des Bois, c'est quelqu'un qui est euh, sur sa propre vengeance, qui, qui ne veut pas faire le bien. Euh, et donc c'est aussi un récit par rapport à ce monde euh, d'argent, ce monde de, de fake news, et à l'intérieur de ça, ce, ce, l'homme le plus riche du monde qui vient euh, en inventant une identité se venger. On a évidemment été frappé par les par les résonances actuelles, qui ne sont pas si françaises, mais qui sont mondiales. Euh, mais on n'a pas eu à forcer le trait, parce que c'est ce qui est fascinant dans l'œuvre et ce qui l'a fait durer dans le temps, c'est que tout ça est dans le livre. C'est-à-dire qu'on n'a pas eu à essayer de travailler sur une modernisation du roman pour lui donner des résonances actuelles. Les résonances sont, sont déjà complètement dans le, dans le livre. I enjoy criticizing France as much as the next guy. However, I think what resonates about the Count of Monte Cristo is really that Dumas created a myth and a myth that transcends societies and time. And so that's why people relate to the novel today. That's why we could become one with Dantes. 
In terms of contemporary resonances, I think it's true that there's an element where we're dealing here with the end of an era, like Musketeers was the end of a sort of heroism of chivalry. Here we have the beginning of industrialization, the beginning of individualism. So in a sense, Dantes is a first great individualist. He's the opposite of Robin Hood. He's not trying to steal to better society. He's just doing things for himself out of revenge. And so I think this selfishness, as well as taking on identities, the idea of fake news, this definitely has contemporary resonances, not specifically French. I think these resonances are global. But what was interesting to us is we didn't have to push these or insert these. These modern elements were actually all already in Dumas' text. Um, yeah. Uh, I think the time might have come to open it up um, to the audience. I can come back with other questions um, in a bit. Does anyone have anything they'd like to ask? Yes, sir. Does this work? No. I don't know how to use mics very well. Um, thank you for uh, this presentation, and thank you for this movie. I have been watching a lot of movies recently that I feel like the production, the characters are made soullessly, and adaptations often lack emotion. And honestly, I have been missing something that will not remind me I have a phone in my pocket, uh, won't remind me. I came in hungry <laughs> beforehand, uh, will just make me travel to a different era. And I feel like the way the acting, the production was made, um, everything was perfect for me and uh, resonated a lot. At the end of the movie, I forgot we had a, a Q&A and I just clapped as I thought people would hear me in the screen. <laughs> and I guess what my question is, is how do you manage this? What does it take to make such an adaptation um, I, faithful, I guess? What's the process? qui a été très important pour nous au-delà de, on en a parlé tout à l'heure, mais au-delà de la, de, la, de la vengeance, on a toujours eu avec Mathieu une vision très romantique et on a essayé de mettre, euh, je dirais, les, tout ce qui était de, de l'ordre des histoires d'amour au centre. Et je, je, on a eu en fait le sentiment que pour nous, euh, la puissance de l'histoire euh, était que, que la mécanique générale de, de, de cette œuvre qui est très sophistiquée, elle a une force parce qu'elle rebondit sur des choses qui sont très humaines et, euh, et un certain nombre d'histoires d'amour impossibles ou une en tout cas qui est, qui est en germe. Donc ce qui est vrai, c'est que au delà de... Pour une question, je dirais, rythmique ou une question, de, je dirais, de fluidité, la chose... On avait envie de faire un film qui soit très spectaculaire. Donc on a eu envie de faire un, un vrai film d'aventure et de renouer avec, je dirais, une forme qu'on n'avait pas vue chez nous, en France en tout cas, de, depuis longtemps. Mais que ça soit guidé vraiment par les sentiments. Et je pense que la chose sur laquelle on a le plus travaillé, c'est d'essayer de ne jamais perdre le fil que tout ce qui est de l'ordre de la... Euh, de ce qui est magique ou euh, euh, enfin, qui provoque, le, 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 qui crée la fresque en tout cas, euh, ne viennent jamais gommer euh, la simplicité des rapports de personnages. Donc on a vraiment été euh, guidé par le fil ténu euh, des sentiments et en sachant qu'à l'intérieur de ça, on voulait inscrire ça à l'intérieur d'une fresque, mais c'est vraiment ça qui nous a intéressé. Donc je pense que si on a, enfin, ce qu'on a essayé de réussir, c'est que le spectateur il soit tenu par les personnages et tenu par les sentiments et que c'est ça qui lui permette de vivre complètement l'aventure. I think a guiding principle for us was that revenge is a central theme, but we also wanted love to be this big guiding principle. We have both an impossible love and a young love in this film. 
Dumas novel has such a complex story engine that we really needed it to be underpinned by these rather direct, simple human relationships. We wanted spectacle, we wanted to have this huge fresco, and we did. But always within this, you have these believable human sentiments, and we wanted that to carry the spectators. I will just add what it translates into from a production standpoint to um, uh, specify a little bit uh, the answer is that you have to st remain very free when you're making the movie because you have a gigantic machinery, there's a lot and a lot of people around and, and you need to not lose focus of what it is you care for, which is story over, uh, you know, just the... <laughs> the scope of what it is you're doing. So it's, uh, I don't think it's an accident uh, in terms of how uh, they were able to crystallize the movie that way. There was a tremendous amount of work before shooting, which was this decision process of what do we keep from the story, but also, I mean, to give you an idea, the first draft was probably 40 pages longer. Uh, and those decisions are critical. What you keep, uh, that you want to shoot versus what you uh, uh, decide is uh, accessory, these are the critical decisions. And it was a very painful process uh, because you have you kind of have to edit the picture before you even start uh, because you want to allow for the production process to give room for the acting, give room for everything that is the substance of the movie. Uh, so I will say that you kind of have to approach those big machines with the same freedom you would a small film, uh, but it's not a small film. So you need to go through that. When, when we did the, the screening for the, for the team of the movie, we were 411 people. So it was a very big team. Pour revenir pour l'adaptation, il y a... Pour, pour comprendre, le, le livre de Alexandre Dumas, il fait 1400 pages. Et notre scénario, il faisait 180 pages. The first one. The first, the first one. draft. Ouais. Which, were, which was brought down to 136, 38. So, the novel is 1,400 pages. The first draft of the script was 180, which then had to be brought down to 136. Donc, tu, tu peux pas... Euh, c'est impossible de vouloir faire le livre en film. Il faut forcément le réécrire, le, 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 le réinventer. It's impossible to just reproduce a novel as a film. You have to rewrite it and in a sense reinvent it. Et par exemple, il y a plus de scènes avec Mercedes dans notre film que dans le livre. So one example, there are more scenes with Mercedes in our film than there are in the book. There's a very famous quote from Dumas which is uh, you have to be careful in the current make it, times. Uh, make it, uh, uh, yeah, no, the, the, you're allowed to uh, uh, betray history. He didn't say it that way. He said you could say that he said rape history, on the condition of uh, making beautiful kids. Uh, but in the spirit of Dumas, uh, I think it was very present. I think I mean one of the things we're very proud of is that the book is selling in France more than 10 times it used to. Uh, and people, even people that have read the book that are very, very close to the book, feel that it, it's faithful. Uh, and at the same time, it's probably the biggest departure from the recent adaptations, uh, and that has been similar even on the Musketeers, but on Monte Cristo, the choices are pretty radical. Uh, but it was made in order to protect the heart of what uh, Mathieu and Exxon believed to be uh, uh, Monte Cristo. Absolutely, and I think that's been a great success. Um, yeah. Yes, um, you, sir, just fine, just fine. Thank you very much. It was um, a real pleasure to watch that. Um, especially, I felt that you had really maintained that delicate web that surrounds Edmond Dantes, and it, yeah, fantastic. My question is about the casting um, and where you started. Um, what were your tough decisions? Um, I thought it was beautiful, but um, I'd love to know your thoughts. And madam, do you want to ask your question as well, just in, just in front, just so we have to? Thank Thanks. you. It's a long time since I studied French, and it was at the other Oxbridge place where Dumas wasn't on the syllabus. Um, but I have heard this on BBC Radio 4 um, and enjoyed it very much. But you, know, you did say that this is one film of The Count of Monte Cristo, and that's clear. But at the very end, when he's, she's reading the letters, and she, 
Uh, on their two words, like attendre and espoir, which makes me think there's going to be another part, that this story is not over yet. Can we have the continuing adventures of the Count of Monte Cristo? Well, My frustration is great. You know. <laughs> after a few flops and a lot of taxes, maybe, you know, um, Count of Monte Cristo too, if we're really, you know, no, there won't be a sequel. Uh, and, uh, uh, à propos, à propos du, du casting, euh, en fait, quand on a, quand on a, quand on a su avec, euh, à peu près euh, au moment de la première discussion avec Dimitri euh, autour de Monte Cristo, donc la décision qui a été prise de lancer euh, l'idée de ce film, alors qu'avec Mathieu, on a toujours euh, refusé de travailler pour des acteurs, par principe pour ne pas se brider. On savait que euh, euh, c'était impossible de le faire euh, pour Monte Cristo, et on a immédiatement, avec Mathieu, pensé à Pierre Ninet, euh, qui en France, dans sa génération, dans la mesure où on avait décidé de tout de suite, en fait, comme un principe, de conserver les mêmes acteurs pour incarner les, les 20 années euh, de cette histoire. On a su que Pierre, qui est peut-être le plus anglo-saxon des acteurs français, parce que c'est quelqu'un qui, qui est un caméléon, et, euh, était le seul à nos yeux pour pouvoir euh, incarner le, tous ses rôles de, de Monte Cristo. D'ailleurs, on n'était pas là quand il y a eu la scène de Lord Halifax. J'aimerais bien savoir ce que vous en avez pensé. De, de, Est-ce qu'il a bien parlé anglais, Pierre Parce qu'il a beaucoup travaillé. Euh, vous nous direz. Mais donc Pierre était là au début et après on, on a fait ce travail très long et passionnant avec Mathieu de réunir une équipe en, avec le plaisir de mélanger aussi beaucoup de familles du cinéma et du théâtre français, des gens qui viennent d'horizons très différents pour lesquels on avait beaucoup d'admiration et, et je ne sais pas si on... Enfin, je, moi j'aime beaucoup notre film mais je suis, par contre, mais, mais je suis certain qu'on a réussi notre casting. En tout cas je trouve très brillant. In conversations with uh, Mathieu and Dimitri early on, Pierre Nines' ca name came up. And for Mathieu and me, this is very unusual. Out of principle, we don't write for actors. Um, but in the case of Monte Cristo, it was clear we needed to know who the actor was. And Pierre Nines came up because out of his generation, he really is uh, a chameleon. He was the only one who had that flexibility to play Monte Cristo, a character over the course of 20 years, because we see the character evol evolve over a long period but also playing all these different characters, uh, including Lord Halifax, whose English accent we hope you enjoyed. And then once we had uh, Pierre Ninet for the title role, it was really a pleasure assembling the rest of the cast around him. And we really enjoyed marrying actors that we'd really admired, both from theatre and from cinema. And if anything, we are certain that one thing we got absolutely right in this film was the casting, and we hope you agree. It looked absolutely fabulous. The production design, everything looked absolutely fabulous. It struck me that it looked very expensive. <laughs> And given we know that um, people across the pond don't like reading subtitles, how do you make, I mean, is a cinema release going to get your money back in France, the French well, one? Or how, uh, do you, how do you make money out of a beautiful film like that? Uh, well, it, it is expensive. Uh, I do feel like we got more on screen than we spent. So uh, there's a sense of satisfaction there. Um, look, it's, we were talking about it. There's a, um, an element of... Uh, letting go to some degree. Just I think Mathieu, Alexandre, and I, uh, and we had started this spirit in a way with the Musketeers, but we viscerally wanted to make those types of movies, frescoes. Uh, and we launched Monte Cristo uh, at a moment where <laughs> we thought everything, I, I guess, it's not about being not reasonable, it's just we wanted those movies to exist. Uh, and Pate shared the sentiment. It was also a moment, if you remember, where everyone was talking about the death of cinema in theaters. Uh, we wanted events for French cinema, and we're definitely uh, excited about the prospect of Monte Cristo traveling, but uh, we thought about what could generate excitement, uh, and in a way, a return to the movies that we loved uh, growing up. 
types. So that, I mean, there's a lot of movies that we talked about that were, you know, that are still are very present uh, in our in our minds that um, generated this love of cinema. Uh, and I mean, the movie is doing extremely well in France. We're going to cross eight million admissions, which is, I mean, the biggest mm, success for a non-comedy in over three decades. Uh, but when we launched it, obviously we we hope for that to materialize, but we didn't know it. Um, but it, it, it was, you know, uh, we have, we've been working together for over 15 years. Uh, sometimes you make movies because you really need to. Uh, and we were fortunate enough to have kind of a, a domino effect. Uh, we were mentioning Pierre. Pierre jumped on board before the script was written. He was cast as Monte Cristo. Uh, and he was, he is the actor of his generation, and he was waiting for that big part to explode. Um, we were coming off of The Musketeers, which were a success, but we felt we could build upon it. And it's the same technical crew. Uh, and we came out of those movies thinking, oh, what can we improve upon? Um, Alexandre's dad directed one of the Monte Cristos of reference uh, for French TV. Uh, I mean, it, there was a sense of like, this is a grail of sorts. Uh, there's, I don't know if you've seen Le Cyrano de Bergerac by Jean-Paul Rapneau. It's a movie that we all love, and we kind of wanted to touch that. Uh, and what Mathieu and Aixon talked about, which is putting this, uh, the Romanesque, I don't know how you translate that exactly, but this, um, this sent sentiment of large emotions. Uh, that was, it needed to be echoed with the sets, the, cost, the costumes, everything needed to be as grand, but it's really the feelings at the heart of the movie that we wanted to. So th there was a, a feeling that the scale of everything we needed to do needed to be at that level. So I will tell you that we didn't know how much the movie was going to cost until pretty much seven months into pre-prep. We hoped, I mean, it was, it was a painful process. It was fortunate that we were friends before because, uh, no, no, I mean, it was, uh, That's you know. really painful process. Uh, the shoot was very happy. The shoot itself was very happy. But the prep was, uh, because it was a mountain and you, you keep, you know. So yeah, there, it, it's, it, it's, we're very fortunate that we got to make that movie with those means that way. Uh, but I must say, I think everyone involved was aware that it, it was an opportunity that was rare and, uh, and that we should make the most of it. Uh, yes, the pack there. Thank you, thank you. Uh, again, thank you so much. It was beautiful. This is the second time I've seen it, and I'm still shocked by it. But um, my question was, uh, is there a specific scene that you are immensely proud of, either in the way that it's come across, the cinematography, the aesthetic, the acting, a scene that pops into your mind? Ce qui est compliqué, c'est, enfin, on, on en parlait... Euh, je parlerai de deux, deux moments pour moi euh, dans un film qui était une nouvelle expérience pour Mathieu avec euh, beaucoup de nouveaux paris de mise en scène, de bateaux, de scènes sous-marines, de loups, de cerfs, de, de chasse à cour. Euh, je repense, quand j'y repense, à deux moments qui sont très particuliers et qui sont très intimes en fait. C'est Dantès et Mercedes euh, assis dans le jardin d'hiver euh, dans cette scène que j'aime beaucoup de... Euh, de reconnaissance en fait entre eux et la grande scène du dîner d'Auteuil euh, qui au fond je pense qui était assez drôle c'est que toute l'équipe est arrivée c'est tellement compliqué tous les jours et très joyeux que quand on est arrivé au dîner d'Auteuil tout le monde pensait que ça allait être une promenade de santé parce qu'ils étaient assis autour d'une table chose qui n'arrivait jamais pendant trois jours et nous on savait avec Mathieu que ce serait une scène très complexe et ça a été une scène qui était très complexe à tourner et très complexe à monter et je suis très fier de la scène à l'arrivée et c'est pas les choses qui ont l'air les plus spectaculaires en termes de cinéma mais c'est je pense les choses qui ont été parmi les plus complexes à mettre en scène. 
So speaking for myself and taking into account before Mathieu and me, this was a new experience. We had underwater scenes, ships, wolves, stags, you name it. But the things I'm actually really proud of are much more intimate. So there are two scenes, really. One is um, Mercedes and Dantes in the Winter Garden, where you have this scene where they're sort of recognizing each other, though it's unspoken. And then the second one is the dinner party at Auteuil. Now, the crew thought that would be a walk in the park, uh, because it was the first time in three days everyone was sitting around a table. But we actually knew it would be a very complex scene, both to shoot and to edit, and we put great care in it. And so I'm really happy with how that came out. Il y a une autre scène, moi, je, auquel je pense, qui a été une scène, je pense, euh, c'est la scène où André tue son père d'un coup de couteau à la sortie du procès. Et c'est une scène qu'on a tournée la première semaine du tournage, au bout de, de quatre. quatre jours. Et en fait, on l'avait mis là en se disant, euh, et sachant que c'était une scène, c'est un peu technique, mais c'est une scène qui, au début, euh, était tournée sur trois jours et on avait fait le pari avec Alexandre de la tourner sur une journée. Et euh, moi, quand, quand on a terminé cette, cette journée de tournage, je, je me suis dit, c'est bon, là, on est parti sur le bon... On avait, on avait, il y avait quelque chose de, de on sentait qu'il y avait de la magie ou quelque chose qui faisait que ça allait le faire. Je ne sais pas comment expliquer ça, mais euh, c'était une scène très dure et, et en la tournant, il y avait énormément de figurants. C'était, il y a eu comme quelque chose de, de léger dans l'air. A third scene I would add is the scene in which André murders his father and stabs him in the neck. So we scheduled that scene for day four of shooting. And it was originally meant to take three days to shoot. But as a challenge, Alexandre and I said, we're going to shoot it in one day. And it was incredibly complex because there's a technical side of a stabbing, but also there was a huge number of extras. And we did it. And at the end of that day, I really had this feeling, not only of we did it, but also we all felt this lightness that this shoot is going to work. This is a sign for how everything is going to go from here. Uh, the gentleman here has a question as well. Thank you. One of the many things that kept me um, um, on edge throughout, almost from the beginning, was the scene in prison when the abbe says that uh, uh, Dantes must use the money to do good. And I kept wondering, when was that going to be picked up? And was there to be a, a, a scene at the end when somehow he redeemed himself from his single-minded pursuit of revenge by softening in that way? Instead, you gave us the softening to the sight of love, if you like. Um, would you like to comment on that? D'abord, c'était, c'était, euh, ça a été au centre de nos conversations. C'est, c'est, on a le sentiment que Dumas, dès le départ, euh, donne une version. Euh, euh, comment dire ça On a tous vu des films de vengeance. Et, et, et on est en général comme le protagoniste et on a envie de se venger. Dumas, il écrit une histoire de vengeance où il y a une amertume de la vengeance. Et la figure de l'abbé Faria, euh, qui d'une certaine manière, et c'est ça que, qui est génial dans le livre, c'est qu'il lui explique exactement ce qui va lui arriver. C'est-à-dire qu'il sait qu'il va trouver le trésor, il sait qu'il va vouloir se venger, il sait que ça va être une forme de catastrophe, catastrophe humaine en fait pour lui, une forme d'effondrement. Et euh, il voit en Dantès à la fois l'espoir, euh, la chute possible et une possible rédemption. Et c'est complètement au cœur du livre. Donc, euh, d'abord, d'une manière plus prosaïque, on a adoré tourner euh, euh, l'histoire de, de l'abbé Faria, parce qu'on a tourné avec, euh, avec Favino, cet acteur italien, qui est un acteur pour lequel on avait une admiration incroyable. Et c'était pour nous euh, génial de l'avoir sur le plateau. Et je trouve que c'est un très grand abbé Faria. Et ce qui est raconté entre eux, et on savait qu'on avait très peu de temps pour le raconter, il y a cette préscience 
et euh, je trouve que ça traverse en fait toute l'histoire et moi je trouve très beau cette, euh, cette fin alors elle est un peu différente dans notre film que dans, dans le livre mais ce qui n'est pas différent c'est qu'il y a cette, cette forme d'abandon de Dantes qui comme on le disait tout à l'heure n'est pas, pas un pardon mais qui est, euh, qui est, qui est le choisir d'un ailleurs où, au fond il renoue avec la parole de Faria donc c'est quand même j'espère quelque chose qui doit résonner et qui est important dans le, dans le film We've all seen revenge films where we want for revenge. We're with the protagonist. We want him to take his own back. But the greatness of Dumas is that he actually gives a bitterness to revenge. And the character of Faria is central to this because in that line, Faria is foreshadowing the entire novel. In that line, he is seeing in Dantes his potential to do better, but also his fall and his redemption. And so we were really happy to work with Favino, this amazing Italian actor who really respected. We knew we didn't have much time to set up the dialogues between uh, Dantes and Faria, but we're really happy of how it came out. And what I hope is, although the ending of a novel isn't quite Dumas' ending, it does resonate in that the protagonist abandons his revenge. And so in that way, indirectly, what Faria wanted has happened in the end. Uh, we are getting towards 10.30, but I think we have maybe time for one more. Um, just uh, there, yes, on the, at the back. You, madam, thanks. Okay. I'll do the closest one. You go. <laughs> Hi there. Um, one thing that struck me both with the Musketeers film and this film is how the camera is almost the whole time on the move, whether it's like steady cams, drones, handheld. I wonder if you could talk a bit about that and how you felt that would drive the pace of the film. And my other question is uh, for Alex especially. Um, to what extent did your father's adaptation of the very same novel influence your making of this film? What's the What's the experience like making a film of the same source material that another, another member of your family had already made? Ah, it's bizarre. Ah, it's normal. Ah, it's normal. Ah, it's normal. Ah, it's on a travaillé donc avec un, un extraordinaire directeur de la photographie qui s'appelle Nicolas Bolduc, qui avait également fait l'image de, des deux films de Martin Bourboulon et Trois Mousquetaires. Et on a décidé de travailler avec lui dès le départ, des premières conversations qu'on a eues avec lui. On voulait renouer avec l'esprit du Technicolor des années 60 et on a, on a beaucoup parlé de, de Visconti, on a beaucoup parlé d'une forme de flamboyance et avec cette flamboyance, avait dans ce film de trois heures cette idée rythmique qui était très importante. Donc on est parti dans l'idée de faire bouger énormément cette caméra de plein de manières différentes. Euh, euh, et donc on a, on a travaillé sur cette idée de, de, de fluidité et d'ampleur et c'est vrai qu'au fur et à mesure du tournage, aussi en travaillant avec beaucoup de séquences qu'on a tournées à 72 images par minute, c'est-à-dire des, des ralentis euh, très prononcés qu'on a utilisés euh, parfois complètement et parfois euh, de manière presque imperceptible, on a aussi beaucoup parlé de Brian de Palma qui a été euh, l'objet de beaucoup de conversations dans le film euh, pour le filmage mais aussi pour le côté euh, baroque euh, voilà après euh, c'est vrai que c'est très émouvant euh, on parle beaucoup de nos pères avec Mathieu euh, il se trouve que le, mon père était réalisateur a fait un Monte Cristo et le, le père de, de Mathieu était pédopsychiatre donc, euh, donc on fait notre psychanalyse tous les deux depuis des années donc il y a une émotion partagée du fait que nos pères qui sont partis l'un et l'autre euh, n'ont pas pu voir ce film ce qui fait partie de nos frustrations mais on espère qu est, que l'un et l'autre auraient aimé ce film so the um, camera work was really down to our amazing director of photography, um, le nom? Nicolas, Bolduc. Nicolas Bolduc, who had also worked on The Three Musketeers with us. And early on, we told him that what we really wanted to channel was 1960s Technicolor. And Visconti was a big early influence. And we really wanted movement, we wanted rhythm, because of the vastness of the film, that was key. Um, and another important influence was Brian De Palma. 
And in fact, we actually used a lot of shots where we were using. C'était 72 par minute. Du ralenti. Du ralenti, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so extreme slow motion effects, which you don't quite see in the film. We actually use it quite subtly. And that was what enables us to have that movement and that rhythm and that fluidity to this three hour film, which is very important. Um, in terms of our fathers, what's quite moving is yes, my father was a director, he did a version of Monte Cristo, and Mathieu's father was a children's psychologist. So the two of us together do our own therapy. And the two of them sadly are gone and can't see this film, but we like to hope they would have enjoyed it. Je, je voudrais juste rajouter une chose sur le... Il y a une chose qui a beaucoup évolué sur le cinéma ces dernières années, c'est la couleur des films. Parce qu'en fait, c'est beaucoup plus facile d'intégrer des effets spéciaux dans une image qui est noire, qui est sombre, qui est obscure. Et la plupart des films américains de super-héros en particulier, et toute même l'imagerie américaine de ces dernières années, sont des films qui sont sombres. Parce que c'est beaucoup plus facile d'intégrer des effets spéciaux dans les images sombres. C'est plus facile de cacher quelque chose dans une pièce sombre que dans une pièce éclairée. Et nous, on a eu envie de renouer avec l'esprit d'Hitchcock qui est fait dans La mort aux trousses, qui fait un, un thriller en plein soleil, comme dans le film En plein soleil, hein, qui était pour nous une référence. Donc nous, ce qui nous a intéressé, c'est de mettre la noirceur en pleine lumière. Uh, a further comment is that in recent years, we have more and more obscure, uh, dark color palettes in films, in particular American films. And the reason for this is technical. Um, it's easier to insert the special effects over a dark image. It's easier to hide something in a dark room than in a brightly lit room. And so another reference for us were films like, if you go back to Hitchcock, North by Northwest, um, or also Purple Noon, where really all the drama is in full light and you can see everything. Thank you so much. Well, I think that we may have reached the end of our time. L join me uh, once again in thanking Mathieu, Dimitri, Alexandra, and you. Julia for her wonderful translation. Thank you. Thank you.